Okay. Can start? Okay. Hello, I'm Wayne Beckett from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, with me is Ed Kussler, the uh, Institute Lecturer for AICG this year. Um, Ed is a, a Distinguished Institute Professor at the University of Minnesota. The topic of his talk is going to be um, the future of the lecture. Welcome, Ed. Congratulations Thank on your you. award. Um, so to start off, I, I know that you kind of grew up in the 1950s in Wilmington, Delaware. My, my view is that was kind of the, the hot time for the chemical industry. Uh, can you kind of give your experience growing up in that, that area and what motivated you to go into chemical engineering? Well, I didn't know there was any other profession. Uh, chemical engineering so dominated that community, known that sometimes people were called it the Duchy of DuPont. And uh, at the time, DuPont was on an enormous roll because basically the chemical industry was changing the clothes on people's back. New fibers, new textiles, the whole thing was an amazingly, amazingly active growth experience. Uh, to cast it in perspective, you can compare it with Silicon Valley. The growth per year at that time in the chemical industry was bigger than the electronics business has ever known. Okay, so very impressive. So you felt like you had no choice. That was the place to go. Why would you want a choice? <laughs> I mean, this was software development and hardware development rolled into one. Mm -hmm. Well, so then you did your undergraduate work at Yale. You decided to do your uh, PhD work at the University of Wisconsin, uh, working with leaders in the field, transport uh, phenomena. But what, you know, when you were doing research, what made you decide you really wanted to go into teaching? Ironically, not research. Um, if I went into industry, I would have started in research and moved to production because in industry, making money is the goal. And you make money in production. Research, at least in the short term, is a cost. Um, on the other hand, if you go into education, you have the most wonderful situation of dealing with people whose age never changes. The only thing that changes is the parents get younger and younger as time goes on. So I really did enjoy teaching undergraduates. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have this long history of teaching. Do you have any observations on how hard the current students work compared to previous generations? Oh students? yeah, this is the standard parent question. <laughs> I worked much harder than my children do. Uh, actually, in engineering, that's not true. Uh, in engineering, the amount of work, I think, has been the same over the almost 50 years that I have taught. The one exception was during Vietnam. In Vietnam, students worked less, but they thought more. They questioned everything you told them, including the technical things. And that was a very divisive time, a very frustrating time, but in some ways an exciting time. Students really did think. If I had my choice now, I have them work a little less and think a little more. Okay, very, very interesting. So, can you kind of summarize with closing remarks on what you're going to indicate about the future of the lecture itself? Well, the question is, what, what can the electronics revolution do in terms of supplying information? Uh, what can the electronics information do to aid the lecture? And there are lots of things. I mean, you can tape your lectures, you can make them available outside the normal lecture hour and so forth. But the key remains personal contact. If, if I'm telling you something specific that I want you to know, I need to do that in as individualistic a way as I can. And, and that's what, uh, why I think the lecture will survive and flourish. It will be embellished, it will be improved by the electronic revolution. But it will remain. It will remain unscathed. Okay. And then maybe an extra final question. Do you feel that there's going to be a, a need for changes in, in textbooks uh, to reflect all these other changes? I don't know. Um, the obvious thing is could you have textbooks which um, which somehow had different routes that you could move down. For example, if, if you asked a specific question about turbulent flow and you had trouble with that, could you somehow give answers in different ways that 
that were answers that personalized the, personalized the experience. I, I honestly don't know if that can be made effective. Uh, I think it would be an enormous amount of work. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining with Kimmy Connected, and I look forward to your uh, lecture. Thank you.